Good morning, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're having a fantastic morning. It is Friday, beautiful Friday. We're having an Inner Circle webinar today. If you're a member of the Inner Circle, that will be at, what's going on with this? That will be at, um, is that better? That will be at 2 p.m. Eastern time today. So I'm excited to see all the Inner Circle members then. We'll be going through all of their questions, whatever they want. Kind of like this show. They get to get online and ask me whatever's on their mind. That is a call-in show, though, where they get to actually call in and ask me their questions in real time. And if for um, some reason they can't be there, of course, they can always send in um, the questions. They can write in the questions, and I will always answer them. So we're doing that later today at 2 p.m. Um, you can check out information for that at pokercoaching.com slash inner circle. What's my topic today? We always present on a specific topic. Let's see what it is today. I actually don't know. I made the PowerPoint a while ago. Post-flop play after three betting. Ooh, a tough one. Um, I think essentially someone asked, what do I do whenever I three bet pre-flop and I just completely miss? Are we betting 100%? Are we checking sometimes? Well, again, it depends on who has the range advantage, who has the nut advantage, position, and then it also, that those factors um, will make you either bet with everything, they'll make you bet sometimes, and when you're betting sometimes, very often you wanna be betting with your best made hands and your draws and checking your marginal made hands and your junk. So, that's that, we're not gonna get into that too much, we'll be discussing all of that later today. So, today's question is essentially, it's kind of a weird, really weirdly written question. The question was, how do I maintain the thrill of playing poker and getting better? That's a tough one because it means this person is already playing for the thrill. Essentially, it makes me think they are playing poker because they want excitement, not because they love the act of playing and getting good at games. And that is a tough thing because first off, if you love what you're doing, if you actually love what you're doing, you will be happy doing it even in the bad times for the most part. Now, of course, sometimes it's not always going to feel lovely. I mean, for example, I love writing books. I just got out of the weeds in a book called Modern Poker Theory that is essentially done on my end. And it was a hard book. I normally love writing books. I did not love writing this book because it was hard. It was, um, a lot of tedious stuff and tedious stuff after a year of it it gets a little bit old <laughs> um and poker like that sometimes does get tedious it, you go you show up you play you play your best for six hours you bubble you go home you do that over and over and over again for about well let's say a year it starts to get a little bit old i get it but if you love it you'll find a way to persevere right like with writing the book i was never going to quit, right? I'm never going to quit in the middle of it. That would be really dumb and really bad, right? And it's important to realize that. Paul says, you grow from struggles. That is true. I hope the book is going to be on Audible. I don't know if that book's going to be on Audible because it has about 500 equations, about 150 charts, something like that. It's not a very good Audible book. Um, maybe they'll figure out a way to do it, though. DP says, poker can get annoying, but the love overrides it. That's really it. So if you have a problem with staying excited, excited, right? Like this is an oddly phrased question because why do you need excitement? Is that what you look for in your hobbies and your games? And you always want to consider those things. Sean says, let's see, you're in the hospital on Monday. Oh no, that's not good. Because my videos that helped you get through it. Well, I'm glad I helped you pass the time. And maybe you learned something along the way. Um, speaking of which, you may notice I have a new coffee cup. Someone here who watches a little coffee sent me this nice letter. Two boxes of coffee. As you can see, this is from the McLaughlin Coffee Factory. M-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N coffee.com. He said, if any of you want to try it, use the promo code POKER and you get 25% off your first order. There you go. Someone sent me some coffee and a coffee mug. It was actually good. He asked, um, it was very nice, Sean was. He asked me, what kind of um, brewing system do I use? I told him an error press. He's like, okay, perfect. We'll grind it super fine, which is 
one of the pains with the arrow press is you have to grind it super fine. So anyway, the coffee's good. You'll notice it is, it is black coffee, in my opinion. When the coffee's bad, you put milk in it. When the coffee's not bad, you don't put milk in it. It's perfectly good coffee. It's very good coffee. Um, so anyway, check that out, McLaughlinCoffee.com, if you feel like giving back to someone who is here in the chat with all of you. Um, let's see. Can I do a webinar going over that book? Well, it's not actually my book. It is Michael Acevedo's book. So I'll ask him. Maybe we'll do something together. That's actually a good idea. Maybe we can do something together. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Um, but yes, that is definitely a very, very good project, and I'm glad to have it off my plate. Now I have a cash game course I'm working on. It's going to be four hours long or more. Um, <laughs> today's going to be a building day, I tell all of you. I, I have a lot of projects needing to be built. I've made all the projects I need to make until June, so I have time to now build, continue working on poker coaching. We're going to be reorganizing stuff there, continue adding more content for all of you, etc., etc., etc. Tom says, just finished Tommy Angelo's book, Elements of Poker, not as dated as you would have thought. I mean, good books typically don't get dated all that much, um, especially books that don't actually talk poker strategy, because Tommy Angelo's book, Elements of Poker, is, is not a book about how to play hands. It's a book about everything outside of the game. It's a very good book. I liked it. All right. Congrats on Grips joining the team. You think it's awesome. Yeah, we're trying to bring on new coaches. We also have Brad Owen, who won Pro Poker Personality of the Year. He beat me. <laughs> um, we got him on doing some guest quizzes now, so that's good. He's making some cash game quizzes using live cash game footage. So check all of that out if you enjoy it. Go give him a follow on YouTube, Brad Owen, and uh, that'll be good. How do I feel about anonymous poker sites? I mean, I don't, I don't care. Anonymous poker sites essentially make it more difficult for good players to win money because they have less reads. But in exchange, very often fewer good players play on the sites, which may make the game softer in general to where they're equally soft as normal, maybe more soft, softer than normal. But um, we're not getting into online poker. I have a video, jonathanlittlepoker.com slash USA. Back to the topic at hand. Today we're discussing how to maintain the thrill of playing and getting better. Step one, do you love it? If you love poker, realize... You're doing it for the love of it, not to make money, not to win. You're doing it to progress through the game. And now you may love making money, or you may love winning, right? These are very different things. And so you have to ask yourself, do I even need to be playing poker? Because poker is a pretty terrible game to play if you actually care about winning, especially on a consistent basis, because you definitely do not get to control if you win on a consistent basis, right? You have literally no control. And so, maybe that's not the game for you. If you want to win all the time, play chess, right? Because the chess is a game where if you're actually good, you'll win. And if you study, your improvements will very clearly lead to an increase in win rate. Or at least let you play against tougher competition competitively. But that's not necessarily what poker is. So understand that poker is a game where all of your efforts may not be rewarded, and often will not be rewarded, in the short run. Um, Tom says, you love playing the game, making money is just a bonus. That's exactly right. And the nice thing about poker is, is that if you study the game a lot, and play a lot, and you're good, you will make money. If you don't, well, you'll lose. <laughs> okay, so what if you fall out of love? I've fallen out of love with poker a time or two. Um, twice during the World Series of Poker, I've had 04X series. If you talk to pretty much every high-stakes pro, they've all had this exact same experience where they show up, they play at least reasonably well, and then they just get demolished. <laughs> and that is A-OK. -okay. It is going to happen. And whenever you lose 20, 30, 40 tournaments in a row, it starts to get annoying. A lot of people out there, though, they never really experience that because they don't put in the volume, right? You need to make sure that you are putting in maximum volume in order to get through the bad runs. A lot of people think, all right, I'm gonna, if I lose five tournaments in a row, I'm gonna take a month off. It's like, well, what does that really do, right? Unless you're spending all that time studying, it just wastes five, wastes a month of your life in terms of poker playing skill. 
and getting experience and whatnot. So understand that taking time off does not necessarily help you get through a bad run or anything like that. It might clear your mind though. Taking time away from anything will likely make you either love it more or hate it more and probably love it more. I mean, absence does actually make the heart grow fonder and burnout is a real thing. I mean, speaking of burnt, being burnt out, right? I've been home for five months working on projects for you extensively on less sleep than normal because we have the two babies and getting a little burnt out. And it's important to realize that, right? But I know that I'm gonna get to go on my quote unquote vacation as Amy calls it, to Vegas to play um, Lost and po Poker all day every day. Um, it's gonna change it up, right? Changing things up will definitely help you significantly. TJ, good morning, good morning. Says you've been studying Mastering Small Stakes of Element Hold'em, good. What book would I suggest you read next? TJ, I would tell you to go to pokercoaching.com and go through all of the homework challenges there. That essentially puts all of the stuff you've learned in Mastering Small Stakes Middle and Hold'em into practice. If you want another specific book though, mm, this one here, Excelling at No Limit Hold'em. This is gonna give you a broader perspective on the game and is going to talk to you about all sorts of different aspects of the game. It's a big book, okay? Lots of people wrote the chapters. I vetted all of it, so it's all good. And um, realize all, this, all the topics may not be for you. Like if you don't care about cash games, stick, skip the stuff related to cash games. If you don't care about heads up, skip the heads up, right? But this is essentially a collection of 20 to 50 page long articles, or I don't know what the word for a 50 page book is. Um, I do know the word, it's not coming to me. Someone typed in the word. Um, anyway, this is a good book for you. Excelling in Nolan Hold'em, you can get it at holdembook.com. All right, so you need to get back in love. And the easiest way to get back in love is to take time off and also realize why you're doing what you are doing. Why are you doing it, right? Why are you spending your time doing these things? Is there a specific heads up display I'd recommend? No, I use a essentially a custom made one that's rather basic. It has only, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, about 18 staffs, but, um, it's everything you need. So is there a specific heads up display? I, I just use Holden Manager and then you can essentially make your own. It's not, it's not hard. When I say you lose that many in a row, does that mean you're not in the money? Correct. When you lose 40 in a row, it means you got in the money zero times out of 40. Enjoy the experience, am I right? The thing is, you have to understand, if you're one in eight to cash a tournament or one in seven to cash a tournament on average, which is about right, good players who win at a high, very, very high rate cash a little bit more than whatever the average field size should cash. So say 15% of the field caches, maybe you'll cash one in eight or 18% of the time or 20% of the time. Back when I had that over 40 run, it was, uh, they only paid 10% of the field. So maybe then it's like 12% um, cash or 13% cash, right? So if you're, if you're one in eight to cash, run that 40 times, run that simulation 10,000 times for the 10,000 tournaments you'll play a lifetime maybe. And that's, you know, you're gonna have a few of those very bad runs. Can I unban you on YouTube? Nope, sorry. <laughs> um, maybe send me a message on Twitter and I'll remember it. I'm obviously not doing it right now because I'm in the middle of doing this. Do I mean pamphlet? No, I think the word is a monograph. I think the word's a monograph. Someone look up the word monograph and tell me if that means a short book on a specific topic. But pamphlet is probably a very accurate word too. Funny, I, like, I can't think of things when it comes to me. Mark says, personally, you want a hobby that makes you think. It was Magic the Gathering back in the day, and Poker provides that challenge now. Yeah. No, you can always improve. Helps you stay focused. Yep, that is exactly, exactly right. How many hours do you think are necessary to see a predictable outcome in cash games? It depends on your win rate and the variance in the game. For example, if you're playing a very high variance game, like Pot Limit Omaha, you'll see... Swings all over the place. You need tons of, a, ton, a huge sample. In No Limit Hold'em, I will tell you, I used to play all day, every day Bellagio, playing about 60 hours a week. And I consistently won between 10,000 and 30,000 every month. So take that for what it's worth. That was me putting in a lot of, a lot of time though, right? A lot of people still put in a lot of time. But I mean, 60 hours a week is 240 hours a month. So if you do that for six months, you'll have a pretty good idea of what you're doing. 
A monograph is a detailed written study of a single specialized subject or an aspect of it. That was the right word. What's a pamphlet? Someone says what a pamphlet is. Um, maybe monograph doesn't have to do with the length. Okay, okay, okay. Maybe pamphlet has to do with the length. Interesting. Tyler says, Excelling in Miller Holden is the first book he's ever read and is such a great read. It's your poker Bible. Good. I think monographs are typically short, though. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I don't know. I'm not very good at English. It's amazing how I can write books and not actually be even that good at English. I always have a joke with Amy that I, I think I only use like 100 words in my books. <laughs> are there any cash books I'd recommend besides my own? If you really want to study hard, read... Expert Heads Up No Limit Hold'em by Will Tipton. All right, so maybe pamphlet is the right word. I think you're right. Very similar definitions, except for pamphlet is a short, a small booklet. So 20 to 50 pages is probably a small booklet. You all got it right. I got it wrong. So again, it seems like essentially they're both um, books about specific topics. One of them is not capped at length. One of them is capped at length. Cool. Um, Bernard Lee's chapter helped you obtain two satellite wins at uh, the Mid-States Poker Tour. Good. Yeah, there's a chapter in there on satellites. It's a good, solid chapter on satellites. And um, it's good. It, 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 that's all you really need to succeed. Fortunately, satellites are an incredibly easy game because you just kind of play normally in the beginning, get some chips, figure out once you're in good shape to get in the money, and then push around the people who are also in good shape to get in the money and don't risk your stack. Easy games. And Bernard Lee's chapter really distills that into just a solid 25 pages or whatever it is. It makes it to where you'll know what to do. It's very powerful to know when you're going to get in the money and how many chips you need to get in the money. And once you know that, you just need to figure out how to get in that scenario and go from there. So a few people wanted me to mention this idea of the Texas home or Texas poker clubs getting raided. Someone said they know I've played in a bunch of them. I've never played in any of them. I've literally no experience there. I know some people who have played in them. I don't actually know what, I, I, I'm completely clueless about this, right? But I do know, if you're doing anything shady at all, at all, that anything that can be construed as shady, realize the governments may get after it at some point, right? For example, Full Tilt and Poker Stars, right? To be fair, they were probably clearly breaking the law. Um, look at the, all the current sites operating in America for the most part. Many of those are operating in a shady manner. And even if it's a little bit shady, the government may decide to get after you. And if the government decides to get after you, you may get screwed. Well, screwed. You're not getting screwed. You're breaking the rules. If you break the rules, you, in theory, deserve to be punished, right? Lots of people speed, but only some get pulled over. And it's not necessarily the most egregious speeders. Think about the most egregious speeders. They may never get pulled over. They never get caught, right? <laughs> um, but anyway... Someone sent me an email saying that they'd already qualified or bought into some big tournament. I don't know what the big tournament is. Maybe a $1,000 buy-in or something, which was a lot of money for them in one of the Texas home, Texas poker clubs. Then the Texas poker club got raided and closed, so now you don't get your money back. And um, that's brutal. 99% says poker clubs are legal in Texas. Why are they getting raided then? They're monographic pamphlets. <laughs> yeah. Um... Someone briefly explained to me in chat who actually knows what they're talking about if the things are legal or not and why they are getting raided. And if there is a actual reason for them to get raided, then, um, then there, there's a reason. Kevin says it's a gray area. Exactly. You all may not know this, but the government doesn't really care if something is expressly illegal or not. Um, someone I know, essentially, I don't know if I need to get into this. Basically, he did something that was the thing that he there, there's something relating to drugs essentially that is very clearly illegal you can't sell cocaine let's say but if you make something kind of like cocaine that's not cocaine and it's not expressly illegal is that illegal and the government essentially says maybe and if we feel like it we'll get you and so they decided to get my guy and he wasn't making cocaine but you get what i'm saying right and with the poker clubs it's a very similar thing, right? So is it actually rake if you're taking it when people come in the door, if you're taking in membership fees or whatever? And that's um, that, that's the thing. So anyway, let's see. They got raked, or 
I, I don't think a lot of people actually know what they're talking about. Let's see. Um, <laughs> you own part of a poker club in Texas, you have to toke off the DA. <laughs> and you never had any problems. Maybe that's it. You don't toke off the DA, you get screwed. Anyway, I don't know the rules because uh, I, don't, I don't deal with this. But I do know that if you are doing anything or working with or cooperating with anyone who is known to be a bad actor or even a slightly shady actor, don't be shocked if you receive some of the repercussions, right? So say you're playing on one of the sites that operate in America or you're playing in a Texas poker room that maybe is being shady. If they close up and take your money, you should not be unhappy or feel offended or feel wronged that that happened to you. You're not necessarily an accomplice, but certainly you are, you're with them, right? Hey, come here. Let's come say hi real quick. You wanna come say hi? I died. What do you have? That's an ice cube. You brought an ice cube in here? Yeah. Can you say good morning, everyone? Can you wave hello? Uh, what do you have? Uh, ice cube. You have ice cube? It's, yeah. it's dripping on my leg. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's dripping on my leg. Can you put it in your mouth? Put it in your mouth. Is it cold? Oh, James. All right, tell everybody bye-bye. You got to get out of here. Can you say, have a good day and good luck this weekend? Um, yeah, Can you say, good luck this weekend? I'm eat it. You're going to eat it? Say, good luck. Good luck. Say, run hot. <laughs> I like it. You like it? All right, eat it. See ya. Bye. I love you. Be nice to Grandpa. <laughs> um... Listen, Tom, if you have an article there, read it and summarize it. I'm not going to read it right now. I'm in the middle of uh, doing a little coffee. Let's see. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. You're in Texas and you know they're a very gray area. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is that just because something is not expressly illegal does not mean that you will not get punished for it. So... Anything that could be construed as maybe illegal, you are live to get punished. And realize the people who had money in this like $1,000 tournament in Texas card room next week, and then they get raided and the place gets closed, and now they don't get to play their tournament, and I guess the Texas people just keep the money, or the government takes the money. I don't know what happens to the money. But um, if you do so, if you play there, realize you're live to just have that money taken. If you play on the sites that operate within America, without all of the licenses within America, you're alive to just have your money taken. And if you're cool with that, that's fine. I mean, this is why I tell everyone, if you're going to keep any money in these American sites, keep, like, none. <laughs> Literally the minimum. And as long as you thoroughly protect yourself, you're probably not going to have many problems. But um, it is what it is. American rules suck, my friend, unfortunately. Yes, American rules suck. Um... Phil Ivy Edge Sorting is a great example. I think what he did was perfectly fine and perfectly legal, but apparently the government doesn't. And you always have to ask, who's the government going to be on? Whose side is the government going to be on? The, the casinos that pay them tons and tons of money? Or a random guy who perhaps, uh, you know, may not even pay his taxes. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, that's, that's bad. I'm sure he pays his taxes. But um, a random guy. A random guy who pays only a million dollars a year in taxes or a government or a casino that pays millions and millions and millions of dollars in taxes. Whose side are they going to be on? Anyway, can we get back to the topic listed, please? That's what Jay says. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. The government can do pretty much whatever it wants, but most of the time it doesn't. That's exactly accurate. For example, um, going back to Full Tilt and Poker Stars issue, right? When they got seized by, or whatever happened, whenever, whenever they got shut down in America... They also got Ultimate Bets, and they also got Absolute Poker, but none of the other ones. Why not the other ones? They weren't big enough yet. <laughs> be patient, right? You need to be patient because eventually when things get big enough to get on the government's radar, that is when they will get you. So anyway, that's that. It was rated for money laundering, according to the article, which is illegal. Sure. What is money laundering? Exactly, right? Money laundering is a weird thing because, well, we're not going to get into money laundering laws, but money laundering is a weird thing. 
All right. Let's see. Are we doing another question and answer and soon? A question and answer soon with someone. The one with Fedor was inspiring. Yeah, we did a question and answer with Fedor Holtz a few weeks ago. It was great. You can find it at uh, jonathanlittlepoker.com slash YouTube. It's somewhere on there, not, not too far down. So check that out. That was a great thing. Thanks to Fedor for doing that. Have I been working out? No. I have been skipping lunch for the last week, and I'm starving. I was listening to my friend, Jason Calacanis, who has a book on angel investing. I've learned a lot from him. And he says, basically, uh, he just started skipping lunch, and he lost a bunch of weight. Go figure. He used to go to um, angel investing meetings where he'd meet, meet um, startup founders, and they'd always have lunch. He said, so he got, he got lots of good meetings, but he got fat. <laughs> and then he said he decided to start doing a podcast called This Week in Startups, where he interviews the people on his podcast instead of over lunch, and now he, now he got skinny. So I've had no lunch for the last week. I'm going to have some today, though, because we have an inner circle webinar. I'm going to have bean sprouts. There's a vegan store right down the street called Ginger Root. It's very nice. Um, so I'm going to have bean sprouts, which have like 200 calories. That's going to be the lunch for the day. All right. Do you look at me like I'm Yoda? You think I'm an old, shriveled green man? That means you're Luke Skywalker. Maybe, maybe, if you're lucky, one day. How much time should you put into study, assuming you have four to five hours a day? However much you feel like putting in, right? If you play horribly, you should put a lot of time into studying. If you play great, you should not put quite as much into studying. All right, let's see. A bunch of games in SLC. I don't know what SLC means. Got busted last night. Don't play in shady games. I tell everyone this all the time. I tell everyone this literally all the time. <laughs> Shimmer says, going a week without lunch, bean sprouts taste pretty amazing. It's true. I'm really looking forward to them. They're going to be so good. All right. Um, next. We fall out of love with the game. How can we fall back in love? Well, you can make playing and studying the game a game. You can find the things that you can control and make sure you achieve them. So what are things you can actively achieve in poker? Well, you can put in significant volume, right? Say you know you want to go and you want to play your best for four hours, right? Someone's saying they have four hours a day to play. Go play. Go play your solid four hours. Put in good work and do your best. And that is going to be very beneficial. Maybe you want to study hard for an hour. We have Grix in the Instagram chat. Good morning, Grix. People say they loved your webinar the other day. They're excited that you're part of the poker coaching team, so thanks for that. Study Grip's webinar. He does long webinars. His were two hours long. And go through that. Sit there. Be focused. Take notes, right? Do that. These are things you can actively control. You could also play the quizzes at pokercoaching.com and really strive to get a good score, right? You can think through everything. Most of the plays are relatively logical, and that will allow you to improve. You can, um, like in the poker coaching homework challenges, right? You can go through and do five of them in a day. And if you do five of them in a day for a month, well, you'll be through all of them and you'll, you're going to be very good at poker. So you want to make sure that you gamify things if you find that you are not naturally motivated. And poker is a relatively difficult thing because you really don't control, control the results at all, especially if you don't get to put in a whole lot of volume. And I understand a lot of you don't get to put in a whole lot of volume and that makes it tough, right? Grip says, making playing well and studying the game into a game is a great idea. Yeah, the more way to get points in life, the better. If you just get lots and lots and lots of points, you'll do it. When you played 60 hour a week, was it a grind or a thrill? Oh, I enjoyed it. It was nice and easy. I would go there, I'd talk to fun people, I'd play good poker, I'd make money consistently. Oh, it was nice. I should probably just go back and do that. I should muck on all of you. You may never see me again. I'm just going to go to Bellagio and sit there all day and make my 30K a month, and that'll be that. I mean, it was a grind, but the grind was fun. I didn't, I didn't mind it, right? I liked it. It was nice. It was really just like a nice time. You sit there, you get paid. It was fantastic. Is Jamin Burton a member of your site now or affiliated with you? Yes, he is. Um, I know he's learned a little bit from me, and we decided to work together where he's going to promote PokerCoaching.com, and we'll see where that goes. We're trying to work with the uh, video bloggers more. They provide a great service. A lot of them are great players, too, and... Maybe we'll work with him. Like we have Brad Owen now making guest quizzes, right? We don't know if he's going to be doing it full-time because it is a time-consuming thing to make quizzes. But 
We'll see where it goes. I'm all for experimenting. If you all know me, I try lots and lots and lots and lots of things. 90% of them don't work, but the 10% that do work, work well, and we make it work. Okay, make it a game. What next? Figure out, so say, say you're tired of studying, you're tired of playing, you don't like it. Change it up, right? Do something differently. If you are getting burnt out, if you're no longer loving your experience of playing poker, try to figure out a way to do it differently. If you used to study by going through poker coaching homework challenges and you got tired of it, well, do something different. Find a friend to study with, right? Maybe just having someone there to interact with would be very beneficial for you. Maybe you need to study in a group setting. Maybe you need to, well, like, well, like I mentioned earlier, take a little bit of time away from it. That'll make you want to get back into it, right? Because you miss it. Absence, again, makes the heart grow fonder. But you need to perhaps do things differently. And there are many, many ways to study poker. Maybe you, maybe for some reason you decided to read 10 books in a row and um, now you're burnt out of reading. Maybe you decided to write two books in a row like I did and now maybe you're tired of writing. So change it up. Do something different. If y'all are saying you're loving... Uh, James' blogs, you can check those out at The Drawing Dead. So Google The Drawing Dead. They're really fun. It's like a comic book. Um, yeah, they're, they're very, very fun blogs. I, I try to work with people whose content I really enjoy. I like Brad Owens. I like The Drawing Dead. So it's good. Wouldn't your coaches play a little differently from each other? Yes, some of the coaches do play very differently. Some of them play smaller and medium stakes. Some of them play higher stakes. And that leads to different skill sets and different strategies. And that's fine. Realize that there are many, many ways to win at poker. It's not all about me trying to teach you only how I play. If you only want to study my quizzes, that's fine, right? There's no problem with that. Just like if you want to buy Excel and Nolan and Hold'em and read six of the chapters instead of the 18, that's fine, right? So you just have to figure out how you want to go about it. But I understand everyone doesn't love me. So I give them other options of people who I have vetted, people who I know are great players. And um, that's good. Best course for learning, a turn learning tournaments. Go to pokercoaching.com. Go to the first and oldest homework challenge. Work your way forward. If you do that, you're going to be in very good shape. Let's see. Fizzy, I think you're essentially saying you have a stop loss or something. I typically would quit when I lost $4,500 by $4,500 big $4,500 at five ten, so 450 big blinds in a day, and that happened maybe 10 or 20 percent of the time. I definitely don't think stop losses are a necessary or a good thing, but they are they're a band aid so that you make sure you don't go off the deep end. Um. How can you translate online play to live play? They're the exact same game. So many people think online is very different than live. I mean, the only difference is that it's harder to win online because people are better. And if you can beat online, you can beat live. Live games are just much, 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 much easier. Mark says, you find it interesting how different coaches have different correct answers. <laughs> Alex Fitzgerald makes some plays that you would say are very unbalanced. Yeah. So you have to consider it when trying to get the right answer. Yeah, that's exactly right. Nathan says, congrats, Grips, congrats on joining the poker coaching team. Congrats, Grips. All right, what else can we do to stay in love with the game? Well, you can accept and realize that studying is not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be easy. Sometimes it is going to be hard. Sometimes it is going to be tedious. And as you move up higher and higher, I hate to break it to you, poker studying does not become easier. It becomes more in-depth because learning... 95% of everything you need to know about poker doesn't require all that much analytical skills, all that many analytical skills. It's more of understanding why the best players are doing what they're doing and then implementing that and adjusting. Whenever you start really trying to get to a super high level, that's when it gets very difficult. And like uh, Mark says here, I, a lot of my plays are very often based on having at least some level of balance. Whereas other coaches, like Alex Fitzgerald, for example, those balance out the window. And that's fine, because very often he's playing in more medium stakes tournaments, like $1,000 buy-ins, $3,500 buy-ins, and $500 buy-ins, etc., where the opponents just aren't very good. <laughs> if the opponents just aren't very good, then you shouldn't be maximally exploiting them, right? 
And I, I guess that's something that is interesting because very often on in my quizzes, I'm always at least somewhat concerned with balance. There are some where I'm not. I mean, I, I'm just thinking one off the top of my head where I just value that like middle pair three times against a guy. And a spot where I, you would never do that against a good player, but I knew this guy always had a worse hand. So if, everybody, if the guy always had a worse hand, then just value that, right? So you certainly should be maximally exploiting, but often I don't have great reads on the opponents to the point that I know the adjustments to make, right? Do you view the latest entries on the homework questions? No, I do not. That would take me literally forever. So sorry. Um, but we, I, I go through all the answers for every new homework challenge and understand that if you answer the homework question from a year ago, go through the forum, find someone whose answer looks like yours, and then watch the video reply and see how I replied to their, their answer. Because there's really only like 10 or 15 ways to answer each homework challenge. And if yours is like way out of whack, well, realize that, right? You want to be trying to find the reasons yours differs from mine and the other good answers that come in. And if you figure that out, that's how you adjust and, and do better next time. Everybody they interview at the European Poker Tour emphasizes studying and taking a step away from the table. Yeah. What, you have to understand how to play well. All right. What next? You need to learn to enjoy your experience. So many people think in their minds that they are supposed to have a tough time. And they torture themselves, essentially, into being angry and disgruntled and annoyed and... This inevitably leads to them not wanting to study, losing their passion, and not enjoying their life, right? Understand, poker for everyone should start off as a hobby. You should not approach poker as a complete novice from the point of, okay, I'm going to make this my job now, and I'm going to devote 10 years of my life to it. Because who knows where we're going to be in 10 years, right? And also, it's a, it's a fun game. You can play for very small stakes. So you need to make sure that you start off playing with the idea that we are playing here to have fun. And once you're doing that, always make sure you're having fun because poker is a game and games generally should be fun. Peter, I don't know about Cash Game IQ. If you like it, send us an email, let us know. Maybe we'll make more. Mark says his goal in Vegas is to make good decisions and enjoy the experience. That's exactly what you're supposed to be doing. DP says, we come from an era where people were giving away money and now it's a bit different. Um, people are still giving away money, just not as quickly, which is why you have to put in a lot of volume. Putting in volume is mandatory if you want to see consistent earnings. So yes, a long time ago, poker was way easier. And that's a okay. Understand that games get tougher over time. All games do. So whenever you do first start playing, obviously you should not be approaching it from, I'm going to try to be the biggest winner ever. Because you have literally no skill. But once you do become pretty good, and let's say you do experience some success, like a lot of success, let's say you get to where you can win $100 an hour playing online. Like that's pretty sweet, right? Once you do that, a lot of people think they're the best, and then they stop studying. And then what happens, right? That $100 win rate trickles down slowly over time. When it trickles down to 90 and 80 and 70, the people start thinking, eh, probably just running bad. Then it keeps trickling down, 50, 40, 20. And they're like, oh my God, I'm in the worst downswing of my life. Then they start breaking even. Then maybe they even start losing. And that's because they stopped studying. So many people stop studying, which is why you have to make sure that you love not only playing and not only the excitement of playing, which is what today's initial question was about, but you love bettering yourself. It's vitally important that you strive and work hard to better yourself because that really is the goal. And you can better yourself in many ways, right? At the table and away from the table. And if you're not doing those things, you inevitably will fail. Because over time, all the good players are going to get the money. All the bad players are going to lose the money. And then you're left playing only against good players. Over time. So 50 years from now, there's a good chance No Limit Hold'em may be a semi-dead game. Um, especially if... Inflation keeps happening. Uh, there, there are various reasons. We're not going to get into it. But in 50 years, I don't know where poker is going to be. But I do know the game will be tougher. They can do a few things to make the games not as tough. One obvious way is to continuously re-innovate the game or innovate the game. 
Um, a good example of this is what Poker Stars is doing, what Global Poker League tried to do with Poker X and with, um, I don't know what it's called on Poker Stars, the one where they have various bonuses and stuff like that. I've not played the game much. I thought the one on uh, Poker X or Hold'em X was actually pretty good. Essentially, they have, they, they try to make it more of a game like Magic the Gathering or Hearthstone where you have bonuses that apply to the game and then they can change it every three months. Or once the good players' win rates get very high, they can change it. Being able to change the game continuously will ensure people continue playing it. The problem with games like Nolan and Hold'em, a lot of games really, is that they get old after a while. And for games to succeed long term, they need to make sure that the game stays fresh. The problem though is that no one owns Nolan and Hold'em, unlike Magic the Gathering or Hearthstone. And, um, you know, maybe someone needs to make a game, like, like PokerStars is trying to do with their, their game where they have all the bonuses. But um, I don't know how I got off on that tangent, but it's an interesting thing. If anyone has a good, good poker variant that we can continuously change, let me know. We can figure out a way to make it a, a real thing. Um, so anyway, you need to enjoy your experience, right? If you are not having fun playing poker, if you're not having fun studying poker, well, maybe you need to change what you're doing, right? I have told many private students that, look, you probably need to not be playing poker. And that's because they were not having fun, right? Whenever I have private coaching sessions with people, we go through their hands, we try to see what they're doing. And if they are just not enjoying what they're doing, and it is a hobby, like, why are you doing this, right? And very often the answer is because that's all I know, or that's, that's what I want to do because I have no real reason. And if you have no real reason, ask yourself, what do you actually want in life? Do you want frustrations? Do you want to be doing things you don't enjoy? The answer is no. I want all of you to be happy at the end of the day. And the way you are happy is by doing what you love and by bettering yourself and by bettering others. I get asked, it seems like every day, why do I make all this free content? Because I enjoy helping all of you. I don't mind. I like it. It makes me feel, what's the word? Accomplished is not the right word. Complete's not the right word. It makes me feel like I'm helping out the community, right? And there's a lot of value in that, I think. As you um, get a little bit older and you realize it's not all about you, you want to give back to people who want to better themselves. And then those people, inevitably, will start helping out more people. Yeah, gratifying. That's probably the right word. Fulfilled? I don't know if fulfilled is the right word. I think gratifying is the right word. Maybe it's fulfilled. I don't know. Anyway, you'll learn that bettering the world is what you're really trying to do because it's not all about you. So many people think it's all about them and they only look with a very, very narrow point of view. And you have to learn to look through other people's eyes, realize what they're trying to accomplish and try to help people who want to also help the world. Did I start playing in 2003? Yes. Everyone saw Moneymaker and wanted to go all in and get rich from quick from playing poker. I never wanted to get rich quick from playing poker. I played for $1 buy-ins and just enjoyed playing. How are you able to keep the mentality of just grinding it out and not be in a rush? Um, I realized I didn't want to go broke. I didn't have much money to my name. I had $50. I really didn't want to lose my $50. So I kept very good bankroll management, right? I stayed very disciplined, perhaps too disciplined, but I did my best to always keep 300 big bets for limit holding, which is what I played when I first started. And then once I moved to sit and goes, I always kept at least 100 buy-ins and more so like two buy 200 buy-ins. So I, I guess I had a little bit of discipline in me from the start. But again, like people say the grind, right? That, that implies you don't like what you're doing. The grind sounds like, ugh, I hate what I'm doing, but I have to do it. It's like, no, I wanted to go and play poker every day. I loved it. I did it all day every day for three years. I jokingly said to my wife on a walk to a dinner last night, um... For like two years, I probably didn't talk to anyone because I was talking a lot that night for whatever reason. I had a cup of coffee, a cup of coffee at 4 p.m., so I was ready to go. Um, but I'm like, you know, I didn't talk to anyone for two years. And I really didn't. I talked to literally almost no one for two years straight because I sat in my room and I played and studied poker all day every day. I loved it. I was probably very clearly addicted to the game and to getting better and all of that. And I loved it. So don't view it as something that's hard or difficult. View it as something you want to do. There was nothing else in the world I would have rather have been doing in that time. And even today, there's nothing more I'd rather be doing right now than sitting here and talking to all of you. And later I'm going to work on this cash game course I have coming out. 
It's not going to be easy. It's going to be strenuous. It's going to be taxing. But I mean, I enjoy it. There's nothing more I'd rather be doing. And I think that's what you want to try to find in life. You want to be doing what you want to be doing. And realize poker is not a get-rich-quick scheme. And I never thought it was a get-rich-quick scheme. Um, let's see. Did I read the Subtle Art book? I did not, but I imagine I already pretty much know most of what is in that from listening to interviews. It's important to realize that other people's opinions don't actually matter that much, especially since most people's opinions are wrong. <laughs> so many people's opinions in the poker world are just factually incorrect. Um, someone made a video the other day essentially saying one of my videos was inaccurate, and then literally almost every point in this person's video was wrong. <laughs> and then there were a few people, of course, in the comments section trying to say, you know, everything you just said is wrong. But of course, then, you know, all the other people who don't know what they're doing trying to pile on and say, oh, no, of course he knows what he's doing. It's like, most people don't actually know what they're doing, and that is A-OK. -okay. Realize a lot of people talk without actually having a purpose or a reason or a knowledge to actually help people. Most people want to feel important. I'm not doing this to try to feel important. I'm doing this to try to help people. And that's, it's important to always ask, what are what is the motivation of the people you are learning from, right? And some are good and some are not good. Let's see. Do I play six plus? Hold on, I've never even heard of the game. You find changing studying platforms to be beneficial. Yeah. Keep it fresh, right? You want to keep it fresh. Brad Booth lived at Bellagio for a couple years. As far as I know, he did. I basically lived at Bellagio for a couple years. It was a lot of fun. Did I say when I'd be finished with the cash game content? We'll probably be releasing that in June or July, almost certainly. Everyone always asks about this balance between study and play. If you're terrible at poker, study a ton. If you're very good at poker, study uh, not quite as much, right? Oh, six plus a short deck. I see. Um, I have studied a decent amount about short deck. I have only played it a time or two. And um, what do I think of it? It's a game. I mean, I don't know. Are we live? Of course we're live. Thank you for Brad Owen's quizzes. You like his analysis. Good. We're going to have more of them coming up. Hopefully you all enjoy them. I think a lot of people don't understand that I don't necessarily... Like, what do I like doing the most now in my life? Going and actually playing poker is not what I enjoy most anymore. What I enjoy most is studying the game and learning the game and helping other people. And I recognize when I am sitting there playing poker at the table, I am not actually helping anyone. Beyond the idea of I'm getting good, fresh content, right? And I have definitely had a change in mental approach to the point where I'm really trying to... Gosh, my, my brain's not working today. I'm trying to help a lot of people at one time. Scale. I'm trying to scale, right? And you scale by helping many people at the same time as opposed to helping only yourself. Because when I go and play poker, say you win $200 an hour. Do I really need $200 an hour? Like, no, I don't need $200 an hour. Sure, it's nice, but I don't need it. I mean, we gave away $1,500 two days ago, right? Because I appreciate all of you. And so why am I playing then? Because I want to go through the motions of playing? Like, I don't need to go through the motions of playing. I've done that tons. Like I said, I sat there for two years straight and didn't talk to anyone, only playing. That, that's enough poker for probably anyone's life. Um, so, it's important to ask for motivations and why, why people are doing what they're doing. And like right now, I am doing what I enjoy doing. I think a lot of people don't quite grasp that. That I've played po more poker than almost anyone and I've done it already. <laughs> A few people have said, oh, can you go back and do a bankroll builder challenge? Well, first off, they don't realize I already did this 10 years ago before it was popular. And then also, like, no, I don't want to do that again. I don't need to do that again. I don't enjoy sitting there and going through the motions of doing it to see if I can do it again. Like, I don't need to see if I can do it again. I've already done it multiple times, you know? It's like, we just don't need to do that. Well, there'll be a poker coaching subscription discount available soon. I don't know. Sign up to the email list at pokercoaching.com and... If there ever is, we'll certainly send you an email. For some reason, when humans think of a fun activity as work, the fun seems to go away. Matt, that is absolutely accurate. So, 
you have to understand that po playing poker is not a grind. It is not work. It's fun. It's what you're supposed to be doing. It's exactly what you're supposed to be doing. If you view it as a miserable time or a grind, then you're not going to have fun anymore. Speaking of a grind again, I don't know if Sean is here. Might as well promote Sean's coffee one more time. It's very good. Sean McLaughlin from uh, McLaughlin Coffee sent me some coffee, this coffee cup. And he says, if you all want to try it, go to his website, McLaughlinCoffee.com, and use code POKER to get 25% off. I get none of that money. We're doing it purely to help one of you all out there, right? If you all have any um, tangentially related things that you think go well with this show or any of my other stuff, send me an email, support at PokerCoaching.com, and let me know. It's hard to combine poker and social and emotional mind. Um, I think you need to have very separated parts of life. I was very bad at this as a young kid. I've become way better at it as I've aged. <laughs> I'm an old man, by the way, for all those who do not know. We have gray hairs now. Um, whenever I was young, all I did was play poker, and that was not good for my brain, probably. Um, but also, I had no good relationships, and people need relationships, I think. And now what I do is I try to have very compartmentalized parts of life. So when I'm playing poker, I am playing poker and going hard, which is what I've always done. But then when I'm at home, I try to work very hard from 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. every day. Solid work day. I don't take time off. I work hard the whole time. And then in the mornings and the nights and the weekends, I try to be with my family, right? And that allows for, um, that allows for at least some balance, right? I'm someone who goes hard when I go. When I go, we're, we're 100%. 150% if you think that's a thing. But um, it's very important to understand what your issues are. And my issues are I will go too hard and I have to control myself. And that's a-okay. What are my thoughts on Antonius's comments about hoodies and sunglasses? I don't know what Antonius said about hoodies and sunglasses. Should they be banned? Probably. Um... There are definitely some benefits to sunglasses, but I think the negatives drastically outweigh the benefits. I mean, the, the, the real benefit is that it gives people who are not very good false confidence. So think about that one. If someone at your table thinks they need to wear sunglasses, they probably lack confidence, and giving them confidence may make them play out of line. Or too big or whatever, right? If you want significant money from a home game, would I declare it? Absolutely. I pay the taxes. It's very important to pay the taxes. I just paid my taxes two days ago. Um, you have to pay taxes. It was a big chunk of money, and that is A-OK. -okay. That is the price you pay for living in America. Um, let's see. Isolation can make someone going through something worse. Um, look, I, I'm certainly not a psychologist. I do know that you need to have relationships. Um, at the same time, though, I think isolation can be very, very good in terms of actually studying and doing your thing. The fact that I spent those two years studying and getting good at poker was very, very useful because I had nothing to distract me, right? I didn't have any, like, mental problems or anything. So, yeah, I'm sure if you have mental problems going into it, it may get way worse. But... If anything, it was way, way better for me because I didn't have to worry about going out with friends or dealing with any other form of work, right? It, it allowed me to hyper-focus on one thing for a long time. Um, Phil Locke wears the uh, gigantic goggles, wonder what's next, maybe a wel welder helmet. Yeah, I mean, then you have to ask what is legal and what is not legal. Yeah, I, I used to have um, a sunglasses line through Blue Shark Optics, and they make good sunglasses, but... I, I don't wear sunglasses anymore under, except there's one, one instance I will. That's when I'm playing against all, or the vast majority, only very, very, very world-class players. Because I want to keep the game as casual as I possibly can. I want it to be very casual. Because when people are casual, they'll give away tells. If you're wearing a hoodie or sunglasses or headphones, you make the game slightly more serious. And as you make the game slightly more serious, people start concealing their tells more. You all may not realize this. I didn't wear sunglasses to cover up my tells. I wore sunglasses so I could stare at people. 
like a like a sociopath or something. <laughs> I, w- I was doing it more so to make them not become very stoic, right? But now I've learned to look at people in a casual way, not like this, right? We've learned as we've gotten older, and I want to keep the game as casual as I possibly can. And I think the casual aspect is way more valuable than perhaps covering up a tell here or there, or perhaps um, feeling more confident or something like that. So anyway, that's that's why I don't wear the sunglasses, hoodie, etc., etc. Hunter says he wears hoodies because the poker rooms are cold. Take cold showers, you'll be immune to the cold. At the Rio, at the World Series, it is frigid, and I walk in there wearing flip-flops and uh, shorts, and I'm A-OK because we have planned ahead. What brand shirt is this? This is called All Saints. My wife's mother thinks I look good in these. She's in fashion. She dresses me now. <laughs> um, they make good clothes. I like them. They fit well. They fit me well. They may not, may not fit everyone well. Um, so that's it, really it. That's all I have to talk about, the thrill of getting better, staying excited. You want to make sure you love what you do. If you don't love what you do, you're probably not doing life right. You're, you don't need to be miserable. We live in an era where literally almost anyone can be happy. Anyone, anyone who acts, has access to the things that people have in America, right? You need to find what you love to do and then do it. And if it's not poker, go do something else. No one said you have to play poker. Realize there's a sunk cost fallacy. The idea that I've spent 10 years playing poker so I can't quit now. Well, yeah, you can. And sometimes it's just the right thing to do. But if you do love poker, make sure you realize you're doing it because you love playing poker, right? It's, it's important to understand why you're playing and what you're playing for. And if it is not a good reason, figure it out. Um, let's see. A decent cash helps. Yeah, having a good score will, will be nice. I would tell people not to play for the chase of wanting to have a decent score or something like that because you'll never be satisfied. So many people who get into anything for the money are never satisfied with the money because they always want more. The idea of some endlessly consuming goal to get more and more and more is detrimental for a lot of people. There was a story I heard, I don't know if it's true, I presume it is, about someone who owned a big company who was worth like billions of dollars and then something happened and he lost like 40% of his net worth. So he went from being, let's say, having $5 billion to $3 billion dollars got sad and depressed and then killed himself because he only had $3 billion, right? He was down, he was down a lot. He felt broke and um, he couldn't handle it. And that's because this likely this is someone who always strived to have more and more and more and how in the world is, gonna, is he gonna get back those more extra billions of dollars, right? And that is very, very, very unfortunate. And I wanna make sure you all don't find yourself in any sort of unfortunate spot like that where you get down and sad and depressed and do something stupid. And all of you saying only three billion, LOL. I mean, understand, it's all about perspective. If I somehow lost all my money and only had 100K left, it'd be brutal. But only 100K, LOL, right? It's all relative. It's all relative. Money is a very relative thing. It's very important to realize that if you are doing things for money, that you have to ask, why do you even want money? What's the purpose? Think about what money is, right? Give that some thought. All right, we have to go now. I have a minute left, says Instagram. Hope you all have a great day. I hope you enjoy yourselves. Hope you have a fantastic weekend. Thanks for being here. Thanks to McLaughlin Coffee for some coffee. Go check them out. Use code POKER to get 25% off. Go to pokercoaching.com. Get your completely free trial. Study it this weekend before you go and play. Go through the past homework challenges. They're completely free if you go and you sign up. Just go to the oldest one and work your way forward. And that's going to go a long way to making you a much better poker player, which is what all I really want for all of you. I want you to get better, and I want you to have a good life. Have fun. Good luck. Enjoy your time. You only have, you only have one, one set of time here. <laughs> Might as well.